So for this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a bit about how the compiler works in terms of optimization and ordering and how you can use that to speed up reverse engineering. So for this example, I've written a super simple application. It calls function one, function two, and function three. And each of those functions does nothing other than prints their name. So if we just run that, there we go, function one, function two, function three. Now I actually had to disable optimization because what the compiler will do is essentially these calls are completely unnecessary. Like there's no reason to call a function that just does one thing. So what the compiler would naturally do is it would pull out this printf statement and just put it directly into main. So instead of these function calls, we would just have printf function one, function two, and function three directly in the main routine. So what I've done is I've disabled optimization, which disables function inlining so that it will actually keep the functions. And you'll see why in a second. So I'm actually going to do this with both Ida and Ghidra so that you can get an idea of how both work and a little bit about the differences between the two. So we have here our main routine. There we see the call to function one, function two, and function three. Now what I'm gonna do is hit the space bar, which will put us into linear mode, which means I can scroll up and down through the code base. So if we scroll up, we will actually notice function three, function two, and function one are all in the exact same order we wrote them when we compiled the application. So typically the compiler will actually keep the code in the same order in which it's written. So by knowing that we can actually make assumptions which allow us to reverse engineer a lot quicker. So for example, let's say this function is an open file function. Well, if the developer is opening a file, they're probably going to do something with that file. So the function either below or above it is likely to be a function doing something with the file, maybe a read file function or a write file function. So by knowing that the code stays, or at least most of the time stays in the order the developer wrote it in, we can actually uh, map out a lot of the code base by just scrolling up and down from functions we've already analyzed and figured out their meaning. And then we will find related functions nearby in memory. So with the same thing in Ghidra, again, we've got our function one, function two, and function three, and we can scroll up and we find function three, function two, function one. Now immediately what you might notice is I'm doing a lot more scrolling and there's all these CCs here. So what CCs are is just compiler padding. And because IDA is clever, it knows we don't want to look at those. So it's just condensed them all into this align 10 hex, which basically says there are 10 hex worth of different values there. So we don't need to look at those, it's condensed them nicely. It is actually a lot cleaner overall, which is why I prefer Ida. But with Ghidra, we can still see the same principles that the functions are together in memory, except we have to scroll through a little bit of extra padding. Now, one cool thing you can actually do with Ghidra that you can't, do with the free version of IDA in x86 is if you go to window decompiler, it will actually attempt to come up with what the C code for this assembly might look like. So it's taking the assembly and it's trying to rebuild the C code that we compiled. Now you can see it's actually pretty accurate here. Um, because some data is lost during the compile process, this is not always going to be accurate. This is always just a best guess at what the code might look like. It isn't the exact code, but it's very helpful. And this is why I recommend learning C and learning to, de uh, to reverse engineer your own code is this C representation is a lot quicker to read. Now this is some very, very simplistic code. So it's actually pretty much the same speed to read the assembly or the C, but I'm actually going to show you in a minute how the same thing might look with a lot more complex code. And another feature that I really like with Ghidra is if you actually select something in the C code, it will actually show you which assembly instruction corresponds to which line of the C code. So our code here is very, very simple and it's extremely obvious which instruction corresponds to which C code. But in much more complex code, that is going to be very, very helpful. Um, this feature was actually added to IDA. I was spamming the developer on Twitter saying like, this is a really good feature. We need this in IDA and IDA does have it now, but it's, uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not in the free version. 
So for this next bit, in order to demonstrate compiler optimization, I've written a really simple application which will add up the numbers 1 to 100 using this calculate sum function. Now, the way the calculate sum works is with a for loop. Now, for loops are made up of three parts separated by semicolons. You have the initializer, the condition, and the modifier. The initializer runs at the start of the loop, so it's going to start by setting the number to 1. Then, as long as the number is less than max number, which in our case is 100, it's going to run the loop. And each time it runs the loop, it's going to increment number by 1. So what that's going to do is it's going to run this code 100 times, each time incrementing number by 1. So what it's going to do is total is going to be 0, and then it's going to add 1. So it's now 1 and then the next run it's going to add 2 and so on all the way up to 100 and the answer should be 5050 if we run it you see 5050 what i'm going to do is compile this with optimization disabled so you could see how you would expect it to look and then i'm going to show you how it actually looks so without optimization we have here our main function it calls calculate sum passing the number 100 which is 64 and a hex so that is going to add up the numbers 1 to 100. So here's how our for loop looks in assembly. We have the initializer here, which is where we set number to 1. We have the part above the initializer where we set total to 0. We've got our total 0 and then the initializer, the for loop, which is only run once. Now the condition is checked every loop and the increment is done every loop. So here we can see we're checking the condition. We're moving number into ECX and then we're comparing ECX with max number. We've got a JG which means jump greater than. So that's going to jump to this code which exits if the number is greater than 100. So that means that this code here is our loop. So we can see it's going to take total and then it's going to add total to number and then it's going to save it back to total. So that is our total equals total plus number. And then it's going to increment number by one, which is our number plus plus, that's an increment in C, it's shorthand for number plus equals one. So it's gonna increment our number and then it's gonna loop again. And then just to show you how that would look in uh, C, as you can see, IDA's decompiling of our C code is actually pretty close to what we actually wrote, which is good. Now I'm going to look at the same thing in Ghidra. Now what we can see here is Ghidra has actually gotten our code somewhat wrong. Now this code does work, but it thinks we're doing a while loop instead of a for loop. And you can see again, we're still setting our total to zero and our number to one and then we are incrementing our number each time. But it has figured out that this was some very different C to what we've written. Now this isn't necessarily wrong, it's still very readable, but it is slightly less clean than either. So now what I'm gonna show you is what the code would look like with optimization. So this time we have our main function, but there is no, there is no call to the calculate sum. What it's done is what I said earlier is it's figured out the calculate sum function doesn't need to be there and it's copied the code from within that function into the middle of the main function. Now something also you might notice is this is actually a lot different from the assembly we saw earlier. So let's actually look at what the C would be this time and it's absolutely nothing like the code we wrote. Now the reason for that is actually because it is not the code we wrote. What the compiler has figured out is it can do the work a little quicker. Now the compiler will typically try and make sure the CPU doesn't do much more work than it has to. So what it's doing here is it's doing number plus one, number plus two, number plus three, and then it's incrementing by four and then doing the loop again. That'd be 1 plus 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 3, 2 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 3. So it's essentially breaking down the, the for loop into units of 4. So each iteration it's going to do 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. 
and then it's going to add four to the number and then it's going to go again but essentially we've divided the number of iterations by four so instead of the 100 that it would normally do it would now be doing 25 and if we look at the assembly code we have 10 instructions here and then if we look back at our other assembly code it is again 10 instructions so what the compiler has actually figured out is that we can do more calculations per loop using the same number of CPU instructions while also doing less loops. So in this example, it is going to do 100 divided by four, which is 25. So it's gonna do 25 loops of 10 instructions, so a total of 250 instructions. Whereas our other code is gonna do 100 loops of 10 instructions, which is 1,000 instructions, which is a lot more demanding. So this is one of the main things that the compiler will try to do, and that is make the CPU work less. Just like if I handed you 100 boxes, and I said move these 100 boxes from point A to B, you're not going to take them one at a time and make 100 trips from point A to B. You're gonna figure out what is the, the easiest load I can carry. Like maybe you can lift five boxes at once without struggling. So now you're going to break that into units of five. Now the compiler could have chosen to break the loop down into multiples of five and six and do even less loops. I'm not 100% sure why it didn't, but this is really just an example of how compiler optimization can change the code from what you would expect. So this is why I'm a big fan of reversing your own C code, because often the compiler optimization is going to take your code and do some really, really weird stuff with it. And it can be fun to just try and figure out what is it doing? Why is it doing this? And it will also give you a good understanding when you see some very strange looking code in the wild. And you're not going to be confused at what the developers was thinking when they wrote this. And instead, you're going to be aware that it was probably the compiler doing some clever trickery to save the CPU some time. So that's all I've got for today. As usual, if you like the video, hit me with a like, subscribe to my channel, and I'm Mawatech on Patreon.